Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with DNA, DNA Technology Part 2. We're going to be talking about biotechnology basically is what we're talking about. Now that we learn about restriction enzymes, we learned that they cut in specific locations and they give us sticky ends that we can put them together. Now we can figure out how to cut DNA from different people or different organisms and compare it. So we can use that for medicine, di medical diagnosis, uh, paternity test, forensics, evolutionary relationships, you know, so many more things. So how do we go about comparing them? We, we go about comparing fragments by using a process called gel electrophoresis. Gel, gel electrophoresis is whenever we cut a DNA and we cut it with these restriction enzymes so we know exactly where they're cut at and it's going to cut the DNA in different length segments or different weights or different amounts. And whenever we add electrical charge to it, it's going to move these segments of DNA at different distances, um, such as down here at the bottom. If you'll notice that it goes from a negative to positive, and this large segment of DNA only travels this far. The next, D the next DNA, whoop, the next segment of DNA fall, travels this far. The next segment goes this far, and the smallest travels the furthest. All right. And this all comes in the premise that DNA is negatively charged. So if we hit an electrical current up to it, DNA is going to be attracted to the positive end, right? So the smaller it is, the further it's going to move because it's going to be easier to move. And the bigger it is, not the slower it's going to move because it's going to be, it's going to be a lot more to move it. Now, when we look at gel electrophoresis, this is what it actually looks like up here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you can see where the different segments are. They make little lines or little bands. And it's because of the way we got it. You, what you do is we will put the DNA in these things called wells, these little indentions. And we add the, the power source, the positive down here. They will move and pull out the fragments. With the smaller fragments being down here, the medium-sized fragments here, and the biggest fragments here, and they'll actually go out. So... If you had an unknown DNA and you put it in gel electrophoresis and then you had a known DNA and you put it everywhere, if they matched perfectly, then they were the same DNA. Especially, let me make this one point. You have to cut both DNAs with the same restriction enzymes so that they're cut in the exact same spots. That's important as well. Now, how can we use this so far as evolutionary speaking? Well, if you had DNA from five different organisms and you put it into into the wells right here put dna in here 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 and here and then you add electricity that's going to cause these dna's to level out now if you'll notice within this section there are some that have very similar dna there are only one thing is different right well these two dna is a turtle and a snake. And on the evolutionary tree, they are pretty daggone close. Now we can look at some other ones, three and four here, for example. Three and four have only one thing, and they are a squirrel and a rat. So they're very similar. Then you had the fifth one over here, which is the fruit fly, and it's not really the same as all of them, so it's kind of a different branch. So you can see that the more similar our DNA is to an organism, the closer we are across the evolutionary tree to them. How can we use this in medical uses? Well, if we had a chromosome with a normal allele and a chromosome with a disease-causing allele, such as Huntington's, and we put them side by side, they're different. But if you, if you had the DNA from a person and you looked at it and every which one they were like, you could tell if they had Huntington's if they looked like allele number two, or they could tell they're normal if they looked at like allele number one. From crime scenes, how can we use this? Well, let's say we have the DNA here from a crime scene, and we got DNA from a victim. So we're eliminating the victim's DNA, and we got three suspects. And here are the three suspects. Out of this, we just simply go, and we see which suspect has these. Bam. So if you look, suspect number two is who did it, right? So that's how it works with forensics. And realize that everybody's going to have a little bit different DNA, and we call it DNA fingerprinting because we all have different ones. It doesn't actually come from our fingers. It comes from our DNA and how it blots out. And this is an actual 
Uh, Jail led phoresis of a crime scene. You see the victim's blood on the far right. Blood found on the defendant's shirt and on their jeans. It's kind of light. And the defendant's blood. If you look at the vic, I mean, if you look at um, the victim's blood and the defendant's blood, you can tell that this person here, ever who this person is, they had this victim's blood, you can tell this is the victim's blood, on their shirt, right? And faint traces of it may be on its jeans. So they, they've been in contact with this person somewhere. And how we get this differences in DNA levels is that when everybody has these different junk DNA, these different amounts of introns, if you remember, but we all, if we use the same restriction enzyme, it's going to cut it in the same place. So if you cut with Eco R1 and me, it's going to cut my DNA in the exact same place it does you, but your DNA might have a little bit different junk attached in mine, so it's going to weigh differently. So when we put it on gel phoresis, your DNA is not going to have the same bands that I do. All right, so for example, if you look here, you got allele number one and cut DNA. The little cut DNA segment, this yellow segment right here, is represented by this yellow band, all right? So if we look at the next one, a little number two, you know, there's where the yellow segment is. It's still cut in the same places, but it may be a little bit different because it has a little bit more junk. And this RFLP is, is what we use for forensics because the closer it is, the more likely you are of getting it. You know, that's where they get it. It's a 99% chance of being this person or 88% chance, etc. And the first place it was actually used in the case was Tommy Lee Andrews. It was used in a 1987 rape case. And, and here's, here's the um, gel electrophoresis that was used. And you can see down here of why he was convicted. All right. Now, if we look up here, it can also be used for evidence in a murder, murder trial. And if we look, let's just let you examine it just a minute. And who do you think is the suspect? Or, or excuse me, do you think the suspect is guilty? And if you look, the blood sample from the suspect was actually O.J. Simpson. The blood sample from the victim one and victim two was Nicole Brown and uh, Robert Goldman, I think his name was. And as you can tell that there are some similarities, the ones that are circled, but that are found on O.J. Simpson and that are found on these. So, you know, did he do it or was he actually at the crime scene? Uh, probably so, right? Uh, it can also be used for paternity reasons. You know, if this is the mom and this is the child, we can tell who the daddy is. Now, it's a little bit different here. Um, mom and dad are going to have a combination of children. So if you look, this one belonged to this person. This one belonged to mom. This one belonged to this person. This one, scare me, boy. Belonged to this person. This person belonged here. On down the line. So you can tell by looking at this that the child had to be between mom and F2. Okay, now, we don't always need a plasmid in order to copy the DNA. We can use a thing called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Basically what you do is you take a DNA. It only takes one copy. You take DNA. You unwind it by heating it up. Then you take and you add primers onto it so the DNA polymerase can attach, right, and begin the process. And then you just simply spit out these um, same copies of the DNA. It's pretty easy when you think about it that we use um, this process to make copies of DNA. Now, the critical thing is getting PCR primers. The primers are they're going to bind a specific location, so you got to get a primer that's on each side of the sequence that you want. And then once you get it, it's going to, it's going to start making it from each direction, right? Uh, now, remember that the first thing we have to do is heat it up so we can unwind it, but realize this denatures DNA. So that's a problem that we have, and the way we overcome that is instead of using our DNA polymerase, which would be totally destroyed at 90 degrees Celsius, 
we use a DNA polymerase called a TAC polymer polymerase from uh, hot spring bacteria. Then we use that to start the whole sequence because it can withstand a 90 degree temperature and then you don't have to keep replacing it each time. But PCR is just a way we can make more and more copies of that DNA pretty quickly. All right, I hope this gives you a brief overview into gel electrophoresis, and I will talk to you soon.